All right, guys, uh, this is our last catalyst for the semester. <sighs> I know, I'm really sad about it. I'm sad about all of you graduating seniors. This is your last catalyst. I'm sad about that, too. But I am excited to finish 1 Corinthians. So if you guys want to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, it's also in the YouVersion app, um, and we'll get started. Um, we're not going to finish the entire book of, of 1 Corinthians because chapter 16 is kind of a, uh, just kind of like Paul's uh, tidy up, like here's the last couple things I need to say. Um, and so we're kind of finished in chapter 15, um, which is finishing uh, Paul's large section of the doctrine of the resurrection. And so this final section summarizes what, what he's already taught. Um, and it echoes some of the final days languages um, that, that Paul, or language that Paul used earlier when he talked about um, Jesus' return and his enemies being conquered, and then the final enemy be, being destroyed is death. And so Paul really plays on that heavily here. Um, and then Paul, in the previous section, explains how a resurrection must occur. And now Paul explains kind of how that occurs and, and answers a couple questions of what that will be and how our bodies will be compatible with uh, eternity. And so our, our first point is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 55. And it's going to be resurrection victory. Resurrection victory is our first point. And so we'll, we'll jump in here in verse 50. It says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So Paul makes two statements here simply to show that our earthly bodies must be transformed. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because the kingdom of God is an eternal kingdom. And so our bodies are still mortal. And so when there's a resurrection, we, we can't inherit um, a kingdom that is imperishable. So then he moves on in verse 51. He says, behold, I tell you a mystery. Um, and, and Paul's saying, behold, it's almost as if he's putting this next verse in, in bold letters. He's saying, listen, listen, behold, this is, this is important. So Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. So Paul says, We shall not all sleep, so we, not, we, we won't all die, um, but we will all be changed. Um, now, some people say that Paul is, is, is claiming that uh, the Corinthian church or some of the people he was writing to would actually still be alive when Jesus returned, um, but that's not what he's saying. Um, Paul never claimed to know when Jesus would come back or when he would return, and so what Paul is saying is, is he's saying we as in the church, and so he's saying that, that Jesus is going to return, and it's going to be in an instant, right? We see that in verse 52. He says, uh, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and at the last trumpet. And so all of these things are kind of just to show that, that when Jesus does return, it's, it's going to be out of nowhere. It's going to be quick. And so he's saying that some of us are still going to be alive. Um, some Christians will still be alive. And so he's kind of answering the question of, of, well, if you don't die, what happens? You know, are you still resurrected? How do you resurrect if you didn't die and Jesus returns? He's just saying, no, some of us will be alive. Some of us will be dead and will be resurrected. But all of us will be changed. All of us will be changed into an imperishable body. End of 52, where he says, uh, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Then in verse 53, Paul says, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body put, must put on immortality. Um, so Paul is kind of answering the question that he actually asked in uh, verse 35, and I'll just flip back to it real quick. In verse 35 of this chapter, he says, But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And so Paul's answering that here where he says, Well, this perishable body must put on the imperishable. The imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. Um, and so what Paul is saying is he's just saying that, that our bodies will be changed. And essentially, our bodies will be made new into a body that is compatible with an eternal kingdom. Because right now, um, even though we're saved, we're, our bodies are not compatible for eternity. They are sometimes broken and sometimes sick and sometimes diseased. And as you get older, things start to not work as well. I'm not quite there yet, but there are a few things. I had to have surgery on my hip. It's just never the same, right? But we, we have these things, right? We know that our bodies are not going to last forever. And so uh, what Paul is saying is that when Jesus returns, we will be changed into a body that will be uh, that will last forever. Um, and it makes sense for him to make this distinction because uh, we do know that there was at least one person who was raised from the dead, right? Who, who was it? 
Lazarus, yeah. So Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Um, and, and actually, at this last retreat that we were at, um, the spring retreat, we were preaching through Colossians, and one of the preachers made a really interesting point. And he said, uh, there's a difference between uh, resuscitation and resurrection. And so he kind of made that in point with, with Lazarus. Lazarus was kind of resuscitated, in a way, to his, um, to his old body. Because we know that Lazarus didn't live forever after that. Um, so Lazarus was kind of resuscitated, whereas Jesus was resurrected. And we know that when Jesus was resurrected and the people that he saw and interacted with, um, he, did, he still did miraculous things. And sometimes he appeared out of nowhere and things like that. But at the same time, we also know that he still had flesh and blood. Because Thomas, right, uh, the doubting Thomas, he wanted to see um, the proof that Jesus had resurrected. And he wanted to, to touch his hands and, and touch the place where the spear had went into his side. And so we know that this body is, is, is something different. It's something new. And so that's, that's what Paul is saying here. And it makes sense uh, that he would make this clarification at this point. Paul then moves on into verse 54, kind of clarifying it further. He just says, When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Paul is saying that at the moment that Jesus returns... And we receive our eternal bodies at the moment that we have a resurrection and we share in that with Jesus Christ. That is the moment that death will be swallowed up in victory. Finally, there will be no more death. And so uh, Paul continues on and he's, and he's kind of quoting from Isaiah and then Hosea here. And he says, death is swallowed up in victory. And then he, he kind of taunts at death. He says, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death. Where is your sting? Death, where are you now? Where are you? Where is your sting? Where is your victory, Paul is saying? It's gone, right? Because Jesus has resurrected, and those of us who have saving faith in him will be resurrected with him. And so death is no longer an enemy of humanity any longer. And so Paul breaks into song, and this is what this is. The death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? And it reminds me of one of my favorite songs that uh, is often played at like an Easter service or something like that. It's called Christ is Risen. Um, and I'm not going to sing it for you, but I'll, I'll read a couple of the verses here. It says, O death, where is your sting? O hell, where is your victory? O church, come stand in the light. Our God is not dead. He's alive. He's alive. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. This is the resurrection victory that we share in with Jesus. Jesus conquered the grave. He died and then he resurrected again. And because Jesus conquered death, we also conquer it through him and with him in the end. And so through the power of Jesus Christ, we have victory over death. Um, but, you know, death is kind of a, a strange thing that, uh, for, for humans. We all know it's going to happen, right? And, and, and it happens to everybody. And it's horrible, and, and sometimes it comes much too soon. And, uh, and it, humans have kind of always had a hard time coping with death. And uh, one of the things that, that I've just kind of noticed is, is that a lot of times we kind of say things about death to make us kind of feel better about it. Um, we'll, we'll maybe uh, say something that sounds really noble about death, like, oh, we'll face death with nobility or something like that, or um, we'll face death as it comes, or, or maybe we'll joke about it as if to kind of uh, uh, lessen the, the scariness of it and, and the pain of it, um, or maybe sometimes we would even live a reckless life um, in, in, in the face of death to, to show that we're kind of not, we're not scared of it. Um, but humanity has always had a weird, a weird uh, relationship with death. And so sometimes we come up with lots of nice things to say about it, um, things that sound noble, things that sound brave. And so I was scouring the internet um, for about 30 minutes, which is a long time on one thing, right? I wasn't flipping through Instagram and getting distracted on everything. 30 minutes on one thing. Um, and I, I looked up what it was, was uh, nice quotes about death. And so these are some of the ones that I found. If you want to throw a couple of them up there, Grant. So death ain't nothing but a fastball on the outside corner. All right, thanks, August Wilson, but you still die at the end. So, uh, next one. Dying is like getting audited by the IRS, something that only happens to other people until it happens to you. Bummer, <laughs> right? We joke about death sometimes. It makes it le less scary. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. Just like everything else you wrote, William Shakespeare beautifully said, um, but still we all die either way. So, next. 
Better to flee from death than feel its grip. Honestly, Homer, what, what does that mean? <laughs> Maybe it's something really smart. I don't know. Next. We all labor against our own cure for death. We all labor against our own cure, for death is the cure of all diseases. That's just dark. <laughs> I don't know how that came up in that. Our life dreams the utopia, our death achieves the ideal. Again, dark. Somehow it's like this makes it better. I don't know. You only live twice, once when you're born and once when you look death in the face. So we only live when we're about to die. I, that doesn't make it any better. Oh, classic Yoda. Death is a natural part of life. Rejoice for those around you who transform into the force. You know, if Star Wars was real, those dudes always, they just go so peacefully, right? You guys saw Luke Skywalker, he's just like, with the robe. If you haven't seen it now, it's your own fault. It's your own fault. Next. <laughs> it is natural to die as to be born. Well, okay. <laughs> Those we love don't go away. They walk beside us every day, unseen, unheard, but always near. Still loved, still missed, and very dear. Um, that one's just, that one's sad. That one's really sad, but it's, it's you know, it's trying to say, well, we, we still have the memories of people that we loved. In the long run, we're all dead. All right, thanks, John. <laughs> and that's kind, of the, that's kind of what it is, right? We all acknowledge that's kind of what it is. In the long run, we're all dead. Um, that, that's, that's the reality of life. That's the reality of humanity. And, you know, we, we, we come up with these funny things to say or these things that sound really noble about death. Um, and maybe we, we hear tales of and celebrate tales of brave men and women who, you know, shouted back at death or faced it well or faced it nobly. Um, but the fact is we, we all still die. And no matter what we want to say about death, no matter how we want to explain it away or make it seem less scary, we all still die. And, and even if we're facing death head on and we say, I'm not scared of you, Really, all that is is the bark of a chihuahua squaring up against a hyena. I mean, it's just, it's pitiful, really. It's nothing. There's nothing that we control when it comes to death. My friends, the world has no hope after death. And in regards to death, the best humanity has been able to do is, is kind of downplay it or, or make it seem better or noble or something. But death is a scary thing. We don't know what's after this. We don't know what's going to happen. But Paul, in 1 Corinthians, what does he do? He talks about death. 54 and 55, he says, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Now, is this a hollow taunt from Paul? Is this just making death sound better? Or is it because Paul knows something that the rest of the world might not have? Death, where is your power? Where is your teeth? Where's your bite? It's gone because the lion of Judah has swallowed up death by death. Jesus Christ died the death that we should have died, and he resurrected, and in that, we can share in his resurrection. This is the resurrection victory. We have eternal victory over death through Jesus Christ. The lion of Judah has devoured death by death, and he's risen from the grave. If that doesn't get you a little pumped up about Jesus, I don't know what will. Our next point is uh, verses 56 through 58. And our point is the resurrection crescendo. The resurrection crescendo. What's a crescendo? Or what does it mean? It gets louder, right? It's like the climax. It's, it's the part of the song that makes you feel all emotional, right? It's the one that's like, yeah, we're... We're, we're really strong right now or something. Um, it's the part that gets you pumped up. It's the part that gets you pumped up. So this is the resurrection crescendo. And before we move into the last part of this section, I want us all to acknowledge that Paul has spent a lot of time, right? This is our third sermon on just this chapter. I want us to acknowledge that Paul has spent a lot of time on this one topic, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul has spent a lot of time on this, and, and, and now he's finishing it up and he wants to make sure that the Corinthian church has a correct doctrine and a correct understanding of, of the resurrection of Jesus and how we will partake in that as well as believers. 
And so in this next section, Paul finishes the thought with a final charge to the church, and it's the resurrection crescendo. It's when the music gets big. It's the big final ending to this doctrine of resurrection. And so let's, let's move into verse 56. It says, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Now, Paul's kind of speaking a little bit of like theological shorthand, if you will, right here. Um, and it's kind of assumed that the Corinthians would have known what Paul means by this um, based on previous teaching. Uh, but he says, the sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law. Um, so this is kind of one of the major, in short, we'll, we'll, we'll unpack this. This is one of the major points of the book of Romans, um, is that the law, God's law, is holy and righteous and good because it reflects his character. It is who he is. Um, but the law is powerless to save. Why? Because none of us can be perfect according to the law. None of us can be sinless. None of us can live a sinless life. And so therefore, because we can't obtain uh, perfection, we can't obtain righteousness through the law, therefore the law equals death. And we sin. And so the, the, the law brings death. And so that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. And so there's just this, this kind of cycle of things. God's law is here and we can't fulfill it and so we sin and, and, and then we, we die because of our sin. And so it's just this horrible cycle of events. But that's where Jesus comes in. As God decided to send his son, Jesus Christ, to the earth, both fully God and fully man, Jesus lived a perfect life according to the law, he obtained the righteousness of God. He was perfected. He lived a perfect life. And then he died on the cross and he bore the sins, our sins, the sins of the world that we should have paid for. And God took out his wrath on sin that should have been on us and he put it on Jesus Christ on the cross. And Jesus died. A perfect man, also God. And so in a finite amount of time, an infinite God paid the price for an infinite amount of sins of the world. But our God didn't just die. Our God resurrected on the third day. And see, this is the, this is the crux of the gospel. This is the one part of the gospel that people want to tell you you're crazy for. That's why Paul spends so much time on this. We can all acknowledge that Jesus is a good guy, a good teacher, all of these things, but we believe that Jesus Christ resurrected from the grave. And because of this, what Paul is saying is that those of us who have faith in him, we will resurrect with him. This is the important part of the gospel. This is the crux of the gospel. It's the part that people want to deny. It's the part that doesn't make really any sense. But Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins. And this is why Paul goes on to say in verse 57, he says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're dead in our sin through the law. Even though the law is good, we are dead in our sin because we can't be perfected through it. And so we sin, and then the punishment for that is death. So Paul says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the resurrection victory. Thanks be to God. Paul then moves on into the, the resurrection crescendo. This is the part that I, I'm kind of referring to here. Verse 58, he says, therefore. Therefore is always an important word in scripture. After 57 verses talking about the resurrection of Jesus and how we share in that and what that looks like and, and how it will happen, Paul says, therefore. So because of all of this, now that we know all of this, I'm gonna tell you one more thing. And he says, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's it. That's the resurrection crescendo. Uh, basically, be steadfast and keep working. Why is that Paul's big point? After all of this about the resurrection, why is that what Paul wants to really bring home with the Corinthians? Be steadfast and keep working in the Lord. Well, we just talked about how, how the rest of humanity doesn't have any hope after death, right? We go on to see what Paul says, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. You see, when we have hope after death, our labor in this earth, the things that we do, don't, they don't just end when we die. 
They don't just end when we die. The things that we do here have an eternal lasting impact because we believe that we will be resurrected with Jesus and we will have eternal life with him someday. This is kind of, this is the Christian's answer to the book of Ecclesiastes. What's the message of Ecclesiastes? Everything is meaningless, right? It, vanity of vanities, it's all meaningless. And it comes from King Solomon who just had everything beyond you know, any wildest imagination. But he said it was all worthless because it is. If you work your whole life for everything and then you die and then it's done, it's worthless, it's meaningless. But through the power of the resurrection, Paul says, abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We have something to hope for after this life, and because of that, we can work and know that our labor is not in vain. So this is Paul's resurrection crescendo, is to keep working for the Lord. There's this thing that sometimes inhabits um, college campuses certain times a year, and it can get really bad. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. It's, it's called senioritis. <laughs> yeah, like at least 30 of you have it, and there's only like 20 of you that are graduating. Probably like 50 of you have it. So with senioritis, right, we all know what this is. It's tough when you're a senior, and, and, and you get to a point where you kind of know you're going to graduate. You kind of know that, you know, eh, this semester I can kind of fudge some stuff, and I'll still have a good GPA. Uh, maybe you have a job lined up. That makes it even harder, right? And so you, everything that you've been working for is really already obtained, like at the moment, maybe midway through the semester, maybe before you even start your senior year. That's when it's really bad. Um, but we all understand, right? And I'm not advocating that classes are useless, but we all kind of understand like, okay, we're going to do the minimum to get by because I got a job lined up. And after that, nobody's going to look at my GPA ever again, right? That is, that is classic senioritis. He says, maybe. If you're like really, yeah, if you're really going, going far, maybe they'll look at your GPA. But then they'll be like digging back to high school and stuff too. That'd be awkward. Facebook stalking. Um, but yeah, senioritis, right? And, and so we understand that, that since we have this goal, it's like, well, the stuff now doesn't really matter that much, right? But this is kind of the opposite here. What we got going on with, with the resurrection and the fact that we will have eternal life, it's kind of the opposite kind of a scenario. Since we know that death is not the end of all things for us as believers in Jesus Christ, we know that everything here actually does matter. It's the opposite. And I think a lot of times we forget that, that when we make it to heaven, I'm still going to be me. You're still going to be you. And I'll still remember things about you. You'll still remember things about me. I'll, uh, you know, we may have a perfected mind and we won't want to sin anymore. We will have a perfected body that's compatible with, with God's eternal kingdom, right? But we'll still be us. And so there's things that, that impact eternity, there's things about us, the things that, that, that we do, um, that will keep, keep an effect in eternity. There's things that will have an effect after death. And that's why Paul says, keep working in the Lord, knowing that the, in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And so basically what Paul is saying is that we should work, we should be working for things of eternal consequence. Working for things of eternal consequence. So let me give you some thing, examples of things that we work for that are in vain. Um, working to uh, live in a really big, nice house. It's kind of in vain, because when you die, you can't take it with you. Um, being the last uh, survivor in Fortnite. It's pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet, but there's no eternal impact. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, being, uh, being the most culturally relevant snob in your group. Um, they're, they're, you know, if you're that cool guy that knows everything about, you know, everything that's going on, sorry, it, just, it doesn't have that much uh, impact. Uh, working your, your life away to, to drive your dream car. There's just no eternal impact in that. You see, there's a lot of things that we do in life, and one of the biggest ones, especially as Christians, is, is comfort. Comfort is our, the Christian way of saying, um, I want to be rich, but I don't want to sound bad while, while I say that. You say, well, I, I don't want to be rich or, or extravagantly rich. I just want to, like, be comfortable. I just want to be, like, like, you know, have enough money to, like, go on a vacation every once in a while. I just want to, like, you know, have enough money to, like, not worry about when my car breaks down. And you kind of, you follow that trail with comfort and how we work for comfort. Almost every single thing that we do in our lives 
is to remove pain and increase comfort, right? Sitting on the couch a little funny, you move, right? Test is really hard. Uh, you, you drop the class and you go take it at Columbia, right? <laughs> oh, that's a throwdown. <laughs> But we do so many things for comfort, but where does comfort get us? It doesn't get us anywhere eternally. It doesn't get us anywhere eternally. And most of those things are not bad. Let's put this in perspective. Um, the Bible never says that we cannot enjoy the things of life, that we can't have pleasures in life. In fact, uh, Paul actually speaks against aestheticism, which is like denying yourself of any pleasure. And so the Bible never says that we can't enjoy things in life, but we got to put our lives in perspective. we got to put the things that we do, the things that we work for in perspective. And so when we think about this, when we think about working, abounding in the work of the Lord, labor that will not be in vain, things of eternal consequence, in Christian life it kind of goes down to two things, um, e evangelism and uh, the process of sanctification. And so when we look at those two things, you know, when we're able to share our faith with someone and they come to the same saving relationship with Jesus Christ that we have, that's of vast eternal value. The process of sanctification it is the process that, that you undergo at the point that you're saved and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit's work in you to help you to become more and more like Christ. And, and we'll never reach perfection in this life, but we will become more and more like Christ as we go. And we should probably be able to look back at any point of our life, maybe a year ago, maybe a couple years ago, and, and say, you know what, I'm more like Christ now than I was back then. And that's something that we should constantly be doing as Christians. I'm more like Jesus now than I was last year. And so that's kind of my application for you guys. I want you to look back on a year ago, a couple years ago, and I want you to look at the ways that you are now more like Jesus than you were back then. And this would include, uh, this would include things like uh, ways that you have been able to share your faith with those around you, um, godly character that you have built in yourself, Sins that you have overcome or made progress in getting rid of. Ways that you have built up other believers around you. Things like that. And then I want you to make some goals for the next year. Uh, and have them be along those lines. Because guys, if, if we're going to abound in the work of the Lord, and we're going to work for things that are not in vain, things that are of eternal consequence, then we've got to know where we started from, we've got to know where we came from, and we've got to know where we're going. Got to set some goals. And so that's my, that's my application for you guys tonight. And that's, that's Paul's resurrection crescendo, is that we would continue in the work of Christ. You see, as, as Christians, death doesn't, death doesn't just represent the end of everything. As Paul says in Philippians, he, he, he longs to go to be with God. But he knows that he has work here to do. And so death for us as Christians is simply walking through one door to another. And it's fine to be scared of death. There's an appropriate level um, that scares all of us. Um, it doesn't mean that we um, just have no fear because we're so confident. Um, but maybe we are. Um, but we know, we have confidence that we will live with Jesus eternally and that our bodies will be transformed to be compatible with God's kingdom eternally. And that's the promise that we have in the resurrection. This is the hope of the gospel is that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. Romans chapter 6 talks about how, how when we are baptized, we are united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And it says that if we're united with him in a, in a death and a burial and a resurrection like his, then we will surely share in a resurrection like his. And for those of us who have faith in Jesus Christ, we know that death is not the end for us. And so instead of making fun of death to put our minds at ease, we can echo what Paul says in verse 54. We can say, death is swallowed up in victory. The Lion of Judah, Jesus Christ, has overcome death by death. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for your plan of salvation. We thank you so much for your ability and your love and, and, and your wanting to save us. You're wanting to redeem us, God. 
And we know that we are so unworthy, but we know that, that you've paid the price for us and we thank you for that. God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for Paul and his uh, explaining of, of what the resurrection will be like and, and how our resurrection will truly be like Jesus Christ and that we will have eternal life with him forever. And God, I thank you that we can, uh, we can look at the things that we do in this life and we can know that our labor is not in vain, that death is not the end, that we can do things that have eternal consequence today. And I pray that this would be, this would be our goal, to serve you, to love you, and to grow to be more like you, knowing that we have life after death. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.